Thank you, Mark. Um, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank our friends and partners from the Center for Immigration Studies for organizing this event as part of our newly formed uh, International Network for Immigration Research on this crucial topic of asylum crisis in Europe and America. For indeed, we are talking about a crisis. Um, as far as I'm concerned, adding up to uh, Mark, Eric's and Victor's uh, contributions, I'm going to deal shortly with um, uh, asylum, crisis, asylum crisis in France as an example of what uh, most of Western Europe is currently going through. Um, first of all, it must be said that the right of asylum uh, has a, a long-standing tradition in France, more than in uh, some other European countries. Uh, it's a right whose understanding has evolved considerably over time. Traces of it can be found um, as, uh, as far back as antiquity. Uh, we know that later Christian asylum was enshrined by the Council of Orléans in the year of uh, 511. Um, then from the French Revolution onwards, the right of asylum was intended to protect those who defended freedom abroad. Um, for example, the revolutionary constitution of 1793 stated that, quote, the French people give asylum to foreigners banished from their homeland for the cause of liberty. They refuse it to tyrants. That is the end of quote. So as you can see, asylum was then seen as a political instrument which was used by decision makers. Uh, while it was granted to friends, it was refused to enemies. Um, from the early 20th century onwards, the number of refugees and stateless people increased a lot in Europe because of wars, because of border movements, because of some uh, internal political events such as the Russian Revolution. And uh, as you know, and Mark will deal about it uh, uh, in, um, in a longer extent, the international community then developed agreements who, for people who had lost the protection of the state of origin, the most important of, of those being, of course, the 1951 Geneva Convention within the framework of the United Nations. So um, while it was initially focused on war refugees and political opponents, the granting of asylum protection has gradually been extended to include grounds for persecution based on individual characteristics, uh, such as origin, race, religion, opinion, or sexual orientation. And nowadays in Europe, under the influence of EU law Victor just talked about, this extension is continuing. And asylum protection keeps integrating new kinds of motives, such as the risk for death penalty, uh, inhuman or degrading treatment, a serious threat lang linked to armed conflict, etc. So this continuous extension of the conditions governing the right of asylum has ended up constituting a, a major immigration channel uh, in France and in the rest of Europe, which is now completely out of political control. Um, we are now a long way uh, from the French philosophy of asylum. Today, here are a few examples of some kinds of people who can be entitled to asylum in France. Chechen Islamic militants, Turkish conscientious objectors, Nigerian ex-prostitutes, women belonging to African ethnic groups who practice uh, female genital mutilation, uh, gay people coming from a Muslim country, shopkeepers who got caught up in, uh, in neighborhood conflicts and who cannot claim the support of the authorities, stateless people of course, as well as a large proportion of countries such as Sudan or Afghanistan. All of them have the right to asylum in France. One can also expect that some sort of uh, climate refugee status could also be granted in, in the near future. Uh, as you can understand, these lax conditions uh, governing the granting of refugee status explains the growing influx of um, asylum seekers to France and more broadly to Europe because Obtaining asylum means that uh, you are not only receiving a, a residence permit. Uh, it is in France. It's a it's a, a first time ten years uh, ten years resident cards for refugees, for oneself and their family. But also, it means that you will benefit from advantageous material reception conditions, such as asylum seekers' allowance uh, and accommodation, then the right to social security, and all the assistance provided for nationals. So of course, all of this explains the striking rise in asylum claims registered in France. Uh, between 2009 and 2022, we have witnessed an increase of 227% in the annual number of first-time uh, asylum, uh, asylum claims registered in France. Um, 
we will get the data for 2023 uh, by the end of January, but uh, according to all the indicators we have so far, um, the, the, the number of asylum claims registered last year uh, may have been uh, 8 to 10 percent higher than in 2022. So if this is really the case, uh, 2023 will become the new record year as regards uh, asylum claims in France. Um, the main countries of origin uh, represented in these first-time asylum applications are Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Turkey. So, of course, uh, seeing Turkey in this list may trigger some surprise uh, insofar as this country uh, still holds an official status of candidate to the Euro European Union. Um, then comes uh, um, a number of various French-speaking uh, African countries, the most frequent one being the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, who all together form a large part of uh, asylum seekers in France. Um, the acceptance rate for asylum applications in France is now around 40 percent. However, even if a slight majority of asylum claims are rejected, 96% of those rejected asylum seekers remain on French territory afterwards, according to the Cour des Comptes, which is a France's uh, uh, highest uh, public audit institution. This, this means that, uh, as Victor said, uh, when you apply uh, for asylum in France, as in many other European countries, you are pretty sure you will be able to stay forever, uh, whether your claim is accepted or not. Um, it has to be stated that this upward trend in France is not an exception in Western Europe at all. I'm just going to give you three quick national examples. Um, over a 10 years period between uh, 2012 and 2022, the annual number of asylum applications registered in the Netherlands has risen by 267%. In Italy, the same number has risen by 350% uh, over the same period. And in Spain, this number has risen by 4,842%. I repeat, 4,842%. That is to say it has been multiplied by almost 50 in, in 10 years. Uh, now, if we want to enable our democratic regime uh, to deal uh, with this and to refund the asylum system its people want, there is no other choice in the first instance than to denounce the 1951 Geneva Convention. I, I will uh, uh, let Mark speak longer about it, uh, or what amounts to the same thing, the, the 1967 New York Protocol, which extended its temporal and geographical scope. Um, but in the current state of EU law, uh, it is not permissible, uh, or it would remain ineffective for the member states of the European Union, because insofar as Article 78 on, of the treaty on the functioning of the EU is concerned, uh, member states commit themselves to develop a common as asylum policy which, quote, must be in conformity with the Geneva Convention of July 1951 and the Protocol of January 1967 relating to the status of refugees as well as with other relevant treaties, end of quote. Therefore, uh, collectively, of course, the European Union could modify its own treaty or at the very least uh, adopt more restrictive, perhaps provisional measures uh, to respond to an emergency situation, which is a, a reality since uh, at least uh, 2015. Um, as things stand, there is probably no consensus at the moment uh, for this at the European level. However, without a change of this kind in EU law, uh, or at least a green light from the European institutions to adopt uh, these restrictive emergency measures, uh, a member state cannot escape this constraint of uh, asylum law, um, which has been transformed, as I said, into a, a right to asylum for immigrants. However, many of them manage to demonstrate or make believe that they tick one of the boxes uh, which uh, make them uh, uh, allowed to benefit from asylum. Um, a nation-state government in Europe, which, uh, like Hungary, wishes to control migratory flows, should therefore, unless it decides to leave the European Union, uh, pull out all the stops to radically modify these European treaties, uh, or perhaps to negotiate for itself some sort of opt-out from this part of EU treaties. Um, one might think that a, a country such as France would have the means to put pressure in this direction, um, because um, yeah, there, are, there is a growing call among many European countries for reform for asylum, and not just in Hungary or Poland. For example, uh, the left-leaning Danish government uh, wants to reform the European asylum system and is campaigning against the reception of asylum seekers on European soil, uh, preferring reception uh, in the centers outside the Union you, you just mentioned, Victor. Um, therefore, to, to conclude shortly, all of this shows that um, asylum must be dealt with as 
a political issue, a democratic issue, which should be subject to democratic accountability, uh, rather than as some sort of overwhelming principle, uh, which take no account of, of people's will, nor of the national interest. And uh, I hope this panel will play a role in this direction. <laughs>